I'm really humbled and honored to be with you today to conclude, ideally conclude, what has been for me at least two days of really fascinating conversations and conspiring as well. I also feel a little bit on me the big responsibility of, of sort of bringing this uh, to a close. So I'm going to try to do my best. The plan is to um, speak for about 25 minutes, but as an Italian national, sometimes I sort of lose sense of time. <laughs> so just signal if you're bored. Also mindful of my flight. <laughs> and, um, and then hopefully have some, some little time for conversation. A disclaimer, uh, you're going to see a lot of Russian dolls in this presentation. It's completely coincidental. I just realized I better tell you in advance to avoid this as a first question. Uh, there's no specific reason, in fact. I'm just tired of internet cats. And I found out <laughs> that actually Russian dolls can be very expressive. Check on Google. You're going to see some of them here. So um, I would like to start with some thanks, because as it happens, um, research ideas, the research process, the sort of rare eureka moments that we sometimes have as scholars, uh, is always a collective story. And as such, this is the story of a group of beautiful people in Amsterdam. This is my research team, uh, also known as the Data Active, one word, all capitals, uh, research collective. We also try to work as a collective. And, but it's also, in a way, the story of the many of you in this room that uh, on a daily basis interrogate data power and that inspire and challenge me regularly. So I hope that I interpret also, you know, um, I mean, this is certainly the result of many conversations I've had with many of you over the past uh, few years. So in Amsterdam, we study what we call data activism. It's a fairly generic label. I'm going to say something about that uh, later. But I hope I have also, of course, to say thank you to the funder, the European Research Council, who's going to really appreciate this thank you. And um, what's going on? So this is the second time that this happens. Um, and um, so what we do is, uh, what we studied about two years ago, and we combine a number of, of disciplines, so from sociology, where I come from, in fact, to governance studies, philosophy, science and technology studies, critical security studies, and you name it. We even have a couple of hackers uh, in our group. And similarly, that my talk today is going to travel a little bit freely across domains, engaging in what we call in Amsterdam anti-disciplinary research. I can tell you later something about it if you're very curious, but you can guess what uh, we are after. So the starting point is, surprise, surprise, it's pretty, fairly obvious to all of you, the observation that datification brings about a fundamental paradigm shift in the contemporary sociopolitical order. This um, paradigm shift has its own specific epistemological and ontological consequences. And here I refer to uh, the last book by Nicole de Andreas Hepp, who say that uh, actually don't speak about datification, it's a bit of a paraphrasis, but um, we can do that as academics. Um, and uh, no, they point to the fact that things are changing to the point that um, we, we are facing a sort of new social uh, ontology that alters, you know, for example, the nature of democracy, but also the role of information, technology, and uh, data in the constitution of the social. And quoting then Boyd and Crawford, who said that, uh, you know, datification, big data, actually, I think they said, reframes quick questions about the constitution of knowledge. We can also say that datification sort of brings about a sort of new novel social epistemology. That is to say, the social cultural process of making sense of the reality that surrounds us. In other, way, in other words, datification sort of mediates our experiences, uh, experiencing uh, the world, and uh, really alters our... Uh, experiences in relation to the state, the market, and society at large. It sort of alters our conditional existence in society in a sort of a bit more flamboyant uh, way. And what's more, it progressively colonizes the imaginary. I mean, we talk, we, we think also in the form of, of data sometimes, and data visualization, in a sort of performative, narrative, and deeply ideological process in which the social, cultural, and political understanding of the reality that surrounds us is really demarcated experience in relation to data and data infrastructure. Now, some of the dynamics uh, that um, you know, I'm talking about are, again, very familiar to you, and of course entail the transformation and the way we make truth claims today. We've heard already a lot about that um, these days, also this morning from, from the keynote, and how you know, um, environmental knowledge is created and shared and, and repurposed over time. Uh, but also, of course, the quantification as a qualitative, superior, infallible way of knowing and the associated 
measurement and objectification of our social world. And here I quote David Beer, who said that as neoliberal subjects, we have a cultural interest in numbers and a culture that is increasingly shaped and populated by numbers. And now there's nothing wrong with that, of course. Um, it becomes a little more problematic when we enter into the real sort of infallible ideology, when nothing else can exist besides quantification and measurement. Then visualization, which is not just a way of presenting information, but is a particularly emotionally charged, immediate way of knowing and discovering the self and the social world. Performance, which we want also visibility as public display of the self, a mechanism of self-evaluation and recognition of like-minded others. It alters the boundaries of uh, you know, the private and, uh, and the public, and it becomes a sort of conditional existence. In a way, visibility, performance, have become a synonym of identity and identity building. And finally, something that concerns a lot of us, um, the increasing blanket monitoring of large swaths of the population, which is accompanied as, uh, by uh, predictive policing and algorithmic decision making, typically, or typical of what Zuboff has called the surveillance capitalism. Um, as I'm interested in, in uh, activism and social change. I'm also deeply disturbed by the fact that ratification has accelerated the crisis of liberal democracy. Frankly, I'm disturbed, but I'm also quite excited because it's not that I actually liked liberal democracy as it was unfolding over the last uh, few decades. So I do believe it provides also an opportunity for activists to intervene into, into the story. And uh, in a way, ratification changes the relationship of trust between the state and the citizen. As Snowden is a case in point, WikiLeaks is another big, big one. It affects decision making and governance and recasts the relation between people and institution. If, this was, if there was ever what political scientists like to call the social contract, well, it is pretty much in shaky grounds uh, today, and also thanks to datification. What I'm trying to do with my team in Amsterdam in the long run is trying to unravel the interplay between data power and human agency. I'm deeply interested in what people do with technology, why they do that, and how they use technology to change the world. I also, by the way, treat the data as a technology in themselves. So that's my sort of point of entry in the connection between uh, these two uh, concepts um, up um, uh, there. And, but in order to investigate, in a way, how we regain agency, I think it was actually also like an invitation that was <laughs> set to us um, in the call for, for, for paper for this conference, we need to first explore what is political agency and how datification changes political agency. And that's what I would like to do uh, with you today. I have a couple of ideas. I've never given this presentation before. I just created it for you. So there's also a couple of ideas I want to test. So I'm going to base on that in my citizen print or, or never again. So treat it as a kind of, uh, you know, a performance of one song by a, by a singer that you might never, never hear again. <laughs> and. Um, so why am I concerned about political agency? Because I keep using the word. I have a lot of anecdotal stories about what is agency, when do we see agency in action, what are the dynamics of agency. But I was a bit confused when, you know, I mean, I sometimes, sometimes I have this feeling that it is used a bit randomly, and I'm not sure that I really know what agency is ultimately about. So I set off doing some research, and I'm still a little confused, but I share where I am at the moment. So. Um, Agency, says Nick Aldry, is intentional, reflexive practice, practice oriented to political action. So it's a way of making sense of the world which resonates very much with myself as a sociology, sociologist. Uh, but it's a way of making sense of the world in relation to, to action. So in order to, to act within said world. Andrew Finberg reminded also us that agency actually affects, is something that is personal, but especially something that is informed. There's no agency in taking a bus or in briefing, for example. Well, it depends on where you're going and what you're doing with the bus, but probably a bad example. But what is important is that um, agency is, is supposed to be informed. It's supposed to have some sort of you know, critical reflection. Um, uh, at the, um, sorry, I actually see different. I'm very confused because I have three screens here. And they show three different things. Yeah. So I have to just uh, make sure that I'm, yeah, I think I'm in the right, the right place. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but so I was not satisfied with this kind of uh, more um, descriptive definition of agency. I was trying to disentangle okay, what is what is really inside an agency in a way. What are the fundamental components and the dynamics of agency? And I went back to a paper that I read a long time ago during my studies, 
1998, uh, actually 1998, there's a typo. There's a typo there, sorry. It's 1998, it's an article by two American sociologists from the, uh, the new school in New York, Mustafa uh, Emir Bayer and Anne Misha, for the American Journal of Sociology. And I find their work quite enlightening. They have nothing to do with identification, of course, not actually with technology or media. So it's 1998. But, um, well, what they say, and I'll read a slightly longer quote that I, that I then put in the, in, the, in the screen. Agency is the temporarily constructive engagement by actors of different structural environments, which, through the interplay of habit, imagination, and judgment, both reproduces and transforms those structures in interactive responses to the problems posed by changing historical situations. Now, this is a typical, beautiful, very convoluted, very dense academic sentence. Mm -hmm. So don't expect you to really engage with it in depth. I, that's why I, you know, I enlightened some red parts. That's what you have to remember. <laughs> so what, I, I treat habits, imagination, and judgment as the sort of building blocks of agency. On top of that, what these scholars remind us of, and this is a much lengthier article, of course, really, really dense. I suggest that you have a look if you're curious, because it's quite beautiful. And um, they stress the two aspects, the temporal aspects, the, 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 the idea that agency unfolds over time, which is not particularly disruptive, if you think about it, but it's not, I mean, this aspect is often ignored, but also the narrative component of agency which sort of evokes roles and responsibilities on people, so assigns functions in a way, and which functions come in also sort of imperative to act uh, sometimes. So um, really what, what uh, this is all about, besides this emphasis on habit, imagination, and judgment, is that agency is not one, is not given, not, and it is not static. Agency is a process. And it's also not an attribute. It's not you know, a little label. It's something that you enact, something that you... That, that unfolds over time. And it is negotiated and renegotiated in relation to changing environmental conditions. So it is, uh, in a way, if you put together all of what I said so far about agency, also from other scholars, agency is intentional, it is reflexive, it is informed. So there is you know, a notion that we're doing something. It is relational. Of course, there is individual agency, but if you're concerned with activism, you care much, much more about the collective dimension of the story. And it is situated in the sense that it comes out of experience. It builds on experience. And uh, so if this is what agency has been described in the 90s in a way, also a little more recently, but. What, uh, what happens with notification? I mean, it's kind of interesting to try to find out, similarly to, to this beautiful Russian doll that goes to the doctor. I love this picture. <laughs> <laughs> Is political the agency altered by notification? And if so, how? Right? Because that, that's actually one of the underlying assumptions of many of the presentations I've listened to these days. Now, I'm not expecting to, to, to teach you anything or to actually give, provide any real answer, maybe just some, some food uh, for thought. So uh, one way uh, in which I try to approach this, uh, this question is this umbrella term of data activism. I've heard a lot of people using it. I'm, I know very, very well that you're not quoting me, not necessarily quoting me, in the sense that this is a very generic term. Probably, the, if I had a merit, merit, I was probably the, only, the, the, the first to submit an application for a grant, but that's about it. And um, so if you're interested in you know, the question of political agency vis-a-vis -vis datification uh, and in social change, the notion of data activism is quite productive and quite useful. What is data activism then? Well, it is, uh, at least that, that's how we define it in Amsterdam, it's uh, a, s a set of social mobilizations. I told you I'm interested in social movements, I'm a sociologist, so th that's what I bring to the table. So the social mobilizations take a critical stance towards datification and massive data collection. But not only, it's not just social mobilization, it's also the set of social technical practices that interrogate the fundamental paradigm shift of datification. I'm gonna provide some examples later, but I'm sure you're all familiar and some, a lot of examples come to mind, the use of encryption, techniques of subversion and obfuscation of data collection machine, but also open data activism and so on, the creative use of information for campaigning, for example. So in a way, data activism identifies new ways of making sense of uh, information, which counteracts, explicitly counteracts the hyper-positivistic ethos of uh, big data. For us, I mean, this is a very flexible concept. That's why we use it. 
We're not particularly fond of it, but it's a good heuristic tool to think politically about massive data collection and generate a conceptual map that, uh, you know, to approach sort of data by itself from uh, an interdisciplinary perspective. In that, uh, in that light, we distinguish at least two forms of data activism. Uh, again, we are in the realm of the heuristic, so we are not saying that this really captures social reality. Re social reality is much more nuanced than that, but you have to make sense of it in a way or another. And so uh, our starting point was to distinguish these two forms. The first is what we call the proactive data activism. So they are practices of affirmative engagement with data. Open data advocacy, <coughs> um, using data to corroborate stories. I'll give you some examples. Uh, in the UK, the missing fish project used satellite and vessels tracking data, data that are actually publicly available, to create interactive maps, actually real-time maps, at least till they run out of funding, that uh, provide um, evidence that allow you to track the um, illegal transport of fish in West Africa. I mean, it's a big, big concern, like there's no fish in, in, uh, in the ocean, but where exactly, wh wh where and how does it uh, get missing, you know, can also be solved by some form of proactive data activism. Going to the other side of the world, Info Amazonia in Brazil, but also neighboring countries, uh, concerns the Amazon forest, a very delicate ecosystem, which, has, as, as you know, is constantly threatened by, uh, threatened by um, you know, environmental degradation. And activists and journalists there engaging in what they call geoactivism are uh, c um, collecting data through a number of, you know, from drones to, to other sensors that um, to, in order to provide, to create their own, generate their own data, they don't trust necessarily the government in this matter, and reports on environmental degradation in the area. But there's also another example that I would like to, to often quote, the Syrian archive that um, engages in what is called open source intelligence, which is also what the people that monitor us sometimes do as well. So combining available data to reconstruct, you know, do intelligence a story. So the Syrian archive is trying to preserve open source uh, documentation relating to human rights violation in the Syrian conflict actually from both sides. And they're trying to do that simply by browsing the internet and looking for this evidence and cre creating some verification mechanism. But also, uh, you know, for example, civic tech activism, and I know there are the guys from Toronto here who are doing an amazing job. So, um, you know, that's, for example, a very good example of uh, proactive data activism here around the corner in uh, this very same country. Now, why do we call it proactive? Well, because, uh, in a way, activists take a proactive stance towards the problem. So they take advantage explicitly, they go out to find opportunities to take advantage of the technological and legislative innovation and available data. And if data and technology are not available, they of course go after creating, creating it or you know, um, asking for it, reclaiming it. The second form of um, data activism that we have identified is what we call instead Reactive data activism. And you can see where it is going from the expression of this poor Russian doll was definitely um, in bad shape. So reactive data activism, uh, in a way, the data activists react to external threats. They come from institution or you know, from the surveillance complex, also the you know, corporation uh, as well. So in, in this realm, you have, you know, for example, encryption activists, but also advocacy groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the Open Rights um, Group in the UK, Bits of Freedom in the Netherlands, I'm sure there's also a, Canadi a Canadian equivalent. Amongst the uh, re re active data activists, there's also those that provide security training for activists, for example, for human rights defenders in authoritarian countries. But also, um, you know, there are the organizers of what is called crypto parties. I don't know whether you know crypto parties. It's uh, what Cor Cory Doctorov has defined the Tupperware party for learning crypto. So if you want to know more about that, attend a crypto party. <coughs> but also, for example, techno technical solutions like uh, Tor or other software that allows people to, to some extent, preserve some anonymity um, online. And now, while these labels are certainly a little bit of reductive and, are, you know, as ideal types, they're also practical and questionable. We do that on a daily basis uh, in Amsterdam. They do identify values, tendencies, and preferences amongst uh, uh, these activists towards data and ratification. So, 
as I said, it's an heuristic, it's kind of valid um, approach. At least that's what we believe. And in a way, this kind of classification also allows us to bring under the same umbrella two types of phenomena that are usually not considered in isolation. So typically you have surveillance studies scholars that maybe look at encryption or security scholars that look at encryption and that you have the, the one that, concern, that are concerned with information studies or governance studies that are going to look, for example, an open data activist. And then you have development scholars that uh, look at communication for development in relation to technology and so on and so forth, right? So what we are trying to do is trying to say, well, actually we are facing, if you're interested in the evolution of activism, then looking at data activism and looking at different phenomena, uh, phenomena putting them sort of under the same roof is a useful exercise. So now, the, the other big question that, that they're still battling with, and we're just a uh, you know, in the middle of data collection, you know, data collection is very messy. So, um, you know, maybe we're going to have different questions afterwards. But what we really wanted to know, what we were trying to find out, is what transforms data information, you can also call it information, into activism. So what, what's the sort of the trigger, what's the turning point, what does it happen? When the fact that, I mean, information is available for everyone, but not everyone becomes an activist. So what is the sort of, what is that creates? activist. Or if you want, where does data or information meet political agency? And one way that I, um, that I would like to offer for your consideration, feedback, and maybe I'm going to discard right afterwards, so you have a lot of responsibility here, um, is to look at that data activism as the bearer, in a way, of oppositional radical data logis. So data logis are then ways of making sense of data and uh, by essential so datification. Now it's easier to understand if uh, you look at the Greek origin of the world and the associated so logos, the noun, but also the, the, uh, the verb. I know there are some Greeks in the room, so I'm not going to venture into pronouncing these things. But um, trust me, I think the reason why I put it there is because it looks good. But also because um, it really, it's, it's in fact my starting point in the sense that Logos uh, entails discourse, entails telling a story, entails re the verb in itself means relating, as in establishing relations, thinking about, but also narrating a reality. And that's what I want, where I want uh, to go to. In a way, um, data logies are the logics associated with data and datification from the bottom up. So we know a lot about the logics associated by corporations, by governments, by the two damning combination when it comes to massive data collection, surveillance, monitoring, um, but also you know, open data and other institutional positives that are less depressing than the others I mentioned just before, but we know little about uh, then citizens make sense of, uh, of datification. And data logies is kind of the, the sort of, the stuff that we are trying to disentangle. And they are uh, you know, individual and collective at the same time. Um, to tr try to, to make sense of that, you know, there's sort of like something that frame, of course, in the shape of, of Russian doll, but <laughs> data logies are, you know, the, the encounter of the alternative epistemologies of data activists. So the, the regular attempt by people that engage with data and activism to reframe what information is about, what it is about, what you can in use information for. So the alternative ways of making fruit claims and supporting um, <coughs> for example, advocacy efforts, and the related pra practices of engagement, which are usually technical, right? So, of course, in data activism, software, data, of course, but also software plays a, li a big role in getting your hands, uh, hands dirty is also part of the game. So, in a way, um, yeah, datalogies are this, and they point to emerging logics from the bottom up to make sense of data. If you want, it is where the dimension of the cultural, the moral, the moralizing values, the symbolic and the emotional meet uh, the, the doing, as in altering practices of uh, uh, daily engagement with data. I don't know why it makes any sense. I'm trying to figure out whether you like the idea or not, but <laughs> it's a bit difficult from here. You're not as expressive <laughs> as my Russian dolls, but I understand you might be a little tired. So. Um, what are the, then, I mean, what makes data logies emerge, evolve, travel across groups and individuals, be reappropriated, ultimately translated into action and critical technical 
practice. In other words, what are the conditions of possibility for political agency in data fight society? I know I'm taking a very narrow perspective, linking it up with a very specific type of activism, which is still relatively specialized and still relatively niche type of activism. But let's let's try to play this game with a you know pretty pretty large broad question. Now, as I mentioned, we are in the middle of data collection and. Um, at the first uh, cursory coding of a bunch of interviews that I took with me on, on the plane, I came up with three sort of conditions of possibility for political agency to emerge in the data fight society. I mean, there's a lot of narratives of disempowerment, and certainly that's part of the story. And I'm part of one of those that actually engage extensively in that, in the, you know, creating and reflecting on the narrative of disempowerment that comes along with, the, of course, massive data collection as one of the facets of, of datification. But this is, in a way, if you want, the more kind of positive um, attempt to make sense of, um, of, uh, of it and try to spot in the field of activism what is that can make things different, where do we have to invest so that um, you know, there is more, in a way, political agency or people are more in power, even if they are in such a difficult and increasingly complex uh, context. And there are these three. There's the word critical a lot. I mean, I'm, you're going to see. I also move into to the, uh, to the end, so critical probably fits, uh, fits there. So uh, the first is critical consciousness. And it's not as it emerges actually directly from the text. It's my reading of it. And if I refer to you know, the notion of coscientização um, in Portuguese, it's in Brasilia. From, uh, you know, it refers to um, the work of critical pedagogist Paulo Freire that some of you might have come across. If not, look it up. Uh, we cannot afford as, as educators of ourselves to ignore such a powerful piece of literature and very concrete advice on how to be better teachers. And uh, so it was of popular educators. And what he was really concerned about was to make sure that uh, awareness is very much tied on with action. So there's no knowledge without acting upon it. And there's no inform acting upon it without, of course, uh, the knowledge. So in a way, um, what uh, activists say is that they need to develop ways of fostering, um, you know, enabling subjects to become aware of the social material conditions of datification, of injustice associated with justification, and translate this sense in, in, of injustice into action. So just being aware of injustice is, of course, not enough to act, to act upon, uh, on something. So this deals, in a way, with understanding the phenomenon, unpacking uh, the phenomenon. The second is the issue of grassroots data literacy, that a lot of the activists that I spoke to um, really uh, recursively engaged on. It's probably the, their main uh, task uh, right now in this precise historical moment. And grassroots literacy is uh, seen as a way to counteract the disempowerment and the opacity of notification. And it is about really getting your, getting your hands dirty, and it's about first-person engagement with data or with corrective measures against surveillance and monitoring. But grassroots data literacy is a strong demystification component. It's making sense of things as bringing things closer to the experience of people, as opposed to you know, this disempowering narrative that um, are very distant from the lived experience of individuals. So this, this, also, this deals with learning, but it's a learning that builds on the understanding of the critical consciousness. And the third point, condition of possibility for political agency in data fight society, is the critical imagination. And critical imagination brings us back to you know, what we've seen early with, uh, with political agency. And if you don't really remember anymore, what were the three elements? But there was habits, imagination, and judgment. So imagination was explicitly there. And um, you know, in a way, uh, the critical imagination is the ability to imagine alternatives with respect to immaterial risks like threats to privacy in difficult times in which you know, people also have sometimes other issues, more pressing issues to, to think about. Unfortunately, this is a very critical point for the ecology, social movement ecology today, in the sense that we get to speak to a lot of digital rights activists, to the vanguard of the technical practitioners, but of course the ordinary citizens, as we heard yesterday, are still missing a little bit in the picture. And in fact, the critique of data and the critique about also the possibilities of data have not yet really become mainstream or enter the agenda of um, you know, other social movements that, for example, mobilize on, um, 
you name it, employment or the environment. This is changing, right? Uh, for example, paradoxically, Trump is making people aware of, for example, uh, certain risk and therefore people, you know, become interested also in the, in the dimension of information, data, preservation, archiving. But it's a sort of longer uh, term uh, program. In a way, what this, this uh, activist recursively says is that we need a new empowering narratives as opposed to disempowering ones. And these narratives have to be grounded really on translations that bring issues of datification, what datification, massive data collection monitoring are about closer to the daily experience of people. And now I'm really coming to an end. As I told you, I have a flight to catch. So, and I know that you're also a little tired. So, but I want to end with really a positive and hopeful note, also because this is what I really take home from talking to all of you these days and listening to your amazing research. But it's also a call for action. I study activists, but I also like to see myself as an activist in a way. So I would like you to become one as well, although this is really an easy audience in that respect. I know that. It's not that your typical academic conference, luckily. So we are the privileged observers. That's a fact. We have the, the tools, we have the theory, we have the time, sometimes, not all the time, but to engage in you know, take, uh, taking a critical look uh, and all of that, right? But so we really have a critical role to play in this process of helping activists, not as like accompanying activists, supporting activists in making, uh, you know, in engaging in grassroots data, uh, data literacy, in the demystification exercise, in the critical imagination exercise, in the critical consciousness efforts. And I have a few, actually, homework for all of us. What can we do? Well, you know, Diagnostics is what we do, right? In the sense that that's disentangling social phenomena is what we are all about. That's what we are paid for. So we can continue to do that. That's very, very important. But we also have to become better storytellers, much, much better storytellers. This is something that already emerged uh, here in the conversation these days. I don't remember in relation to what panel, but I'm sure it was in, in more than one. Um, you know, how do we also speak to people out there? How can we contribute to create the powerful, empowering narratives that the activists are struggling with? And narratives that are temporal, that embed roles and responsibilities, narratives that, in, that sort of embed agency as opposed to sort of exclude it. We also have to engage in the, in the exercise of pinpointing all the risks, right? That's actually what in Amsterdam we, we do most of the time. But it cannot be just that. We cannot just talk about surveillance, we also have to provide fixes in a way, offer people hopeful ways out in a way, uh, while uh, you know, making them aware of the risks. And then we are educators, that's also you know, in, in our job description in a way. But uh, being educators is slightly different than being teachers, right? And uh, so the, the invitation to critical pedagogy that comes from the activists, but comes also from the work of Paul Freire, we need to contribute to create citizens, inform citizens that are able and willing and that value the engagement with the issues over time. Not just scholars, I mean, emerging scholars, future, I mean, students with, with top uh, grade, grades. And then we have to become translators ourselves, translators of complex phenomena that you observed, um, and translators that, you know, this is also very much tied up with becoming better storytellers. Then we are, we are skill transfers. We have to become skill transfers. This actually comes from one of the roles of data activists that one of my PhD students would defend a few days ago, Miren Gutierrez, look it up, from, the, uh, from, from Spain, um, identified as one of the roles of data activists themselves. And then I was like, well, as I was reading our thesis, well, this is also a role for us as observers of the social phenomenon. So skill transfers, transfers. sometimes technical skills, we do have some of, some of those, but not only technical skills that needed here, there's much more that we need to, to bring over. Uh, to, uh, to the people that we observe. I say we observe because I work with activists on a regular basis. And finally, and this also came out very strongly in many of the, of the panels that, that I attended these days, we have to become <laughs> facilitators. So we have to, we have, as I said, the time and the skills, maybe the skills less the time, but we have to engage in partnership with activists. We have to identify research questions, not just bring our research back to the activists when it is done, and organize the kind of media NGO, societal relevance, 
and valorization meeting, but try to engage with, uh, with the activists from the, for the onset, try to identify what are the questions that they are after and how can we help them, support them, facilitate their own learning processes. We don't have to teach them anything. I mean, actually, we don't know much more than us about a lot of things. But facilitating, I mean, everyone needs support and we, are, we have a big uh, struggle ahead of us, so we, we might as well collaborate. So, well, um, with this, um, you know, I, I can conclude. Uh, so I'm giving, sending you home with a lot of, hopefully, food for thought and potential tasks to take upon yourself. And I conclude showing you simply the last slide, which has our beautiful website, but especially, if it works, a GIF, because GIFs are cool. <laughs> Thank you very much.